physical intimacy from a biblical perspective. <clears throat> Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One of God's purposes in marriage is the legitimate sexual fulfillment of the husband and wife. God desires that a husband and wife shall become one flesh. The one flesh relationship is broader than the sexual relationship, but it certainly includes it. It's God's desire that married couples become one sexually. The sexual relationship between a husband and wife is an area that can bring great pleasure and, and enhance a marriage, but it's also an area where problems commonly occur. And God has much to say about the sexual relationship between married couples and about how Christians are to conduct themselves uh, sexually, whether married or not. When couples follow God's word in this area, they bring glory to him and great blessings to themselves. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, even in the area of intimacy, we're, we need to do this to the glory of God. And so in this lesson, we're going to look at several biblical principles regarding sex. And so it's going to be just kind of going one by one. The first principle, sex is for married couples only. It's important to realize that God's view of sex is much different than the world's view of sex. God designed this wonderful gift for married couples only. Sexual relations are to be freely enjoyed, but only within the confines of the marriage covenant. In spite of what God's word teaches, sex outside of marriage is common today. Dr. Scott states that our country has been in a moral decline over the past 50 years, which has drastically affected our culture. We're living in a society that largely ignores what the Bible has to say about sex. The boundaries of marriage have been relaxed. Cohabitation is all around us. Premarital sex has become more the norm than the exception. Adultery has become commonplace. And nevertheless, in spite of cultural practices, the Bible strongly teaches that to engage in sexual relations outside of marriage is always sinful. The Bible has much to say about it. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge both fornicators and adulterers. Fornication is a broad term for any sexual immorality, but it often refers to premarital sex. Adultery is committed when a married person has sexual relations with anyone other than their spouse. Premarital and extramarital sexual relations are always sinful, and to engage in them is unbecoming of a Christian. It's contrary to following Christ. Yet God has graciously given us a solution to deal with our sexual desires. He's provided marriage as a protection against sexual sin. The Bible tells us that one of the functions of marriage in a fallen world is to help guard against temptation to immorality. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. For this reason, unless one has been given the gift of celibacy, marriage should be pursued. 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says, But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And so... Marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is something that should be pursued if you do not have the gift of celibacy. Marriage authorizes the sexual relationship between a man and a woman and is clearly a God-given gift to help keep us from sexual sin. Second principle, sex within marriage is good. God created sex as something holy and good. Genesis 131, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Sex as God intends it to be is honorable. The gardener states, within the protective boundaries of the wife-husband relationship, sex brings incredible honor to God. And again, Hebrews 13, 14, 4 says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Martha P. states, an undefiled marriage bed means the couple has sexual relations and neither one is unfaithful to the other, 
nor impure in their thoughts or their actions. She further states that a wife having undefiled sex with her husband is in no way sinful or dirty. She should have a godly attitude realizing that physical intimacy with her husband is not an unholy or less holy act than praying or singing in the choir as long as her thoughts and motives and actions are pure. She's pleasing to God, and God views what she is doing as good. When sexual intimacy is as God intended, it is good and is pleasing to God. A third principle. Pleasure is assumed and is not sinful. There have been times in history when sex was seen as something to put up with and a necessary evil for procreation. And those attitudes are not biblical. God gave sex as a gift to married couples and intended it to be pleasurable. In Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. Song of Solomon 7.10, it says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the country. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us rise early and go to the vineyards. Let us see whether the vine has budded and its blossoms have opened and whether the pomegranates have bloomed. There I will give you my love. So having pleasure in physical intimacy is assumed by Scripture. Married couples should enjoy it freely. The fourth principle, sex is an expression of complete oneness. Genesis 2.24, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There is no place where the complete oneness of a husband and wife is more clearly and beautifully communicated and experienced than in their sexual relationship. Their very bodies are designed to become one flesh. Sexual intercourse is more than a physical act. It's a symbol of a spiritual relationship and the expression of the complete oneness of two persons in married love. It is the means by which they are confirmed and nourished in that union. The true dignity of sex is in its ability to enhance this personal unity between two persons who have committed themselves to each other in love and marriage. In sexual intercourse, the couple becomes joined in an indissoluble unity called in the Bible, one flesh. God has designed the sex act to truly bring a husband and wife into complete oneness. Now let's, let's look at some biblical directives regarding sex. These are directions. The Bible has many directions regarding the proper use of sex within the confines of marriage. And so, number one, Sex is to be other-focused. As in every other area of marriage, in the sexual relationship, the focus is not to be self-centered, but other-centered. Love is always giving. It's always concerned about the needs and the desires of the other person first and foremost. Biblical love is selfless rather than selfish, and this certainly applies to the sexual relationship. When you're loving in a biblical manner, you're always more concerned about pleasing your partner than having your partner please you. Your aim should be to serve and please your spouse rather than being served. When a husband or wife becomes more focused on giving than receiving, they are truly blessed. The Bible says in Acts 20, 35, remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Problems do occur when sex is self-focused. Problems often occur between couples when one or both partners are self-focused in their sexual relations. Generally speaking, husbands tend to get stimulated faster and they want sex more fre frequently than their wives. It's not always the case, but often is the case. They often become self-focused. They get concerned about getting their desires satisfied. When a husband is self-focused, he will often not consider the desires of his wife. He's too busy thinking of what he wants instead. Rather than giving, he's more interested in receiving Rather than meeting her desires, he's concerned that his desires are, are met. He wants what he wants, and he will often run, run right over his wife to get it. Some husbands even get demanding instead of being loving. When a husband's desires and pleasures are his main concern, 
and he fails to take care of his wife's desires, in time his wife will begin to feel like an object to be used rather than a person who is loved. And this type of self-focus damages marriages. In time, a wife who feels used will become bitter, and the whole marriage will begin to suffer. Husbands, it's vital to love your wife in a giving way. It's extremely important to be other-focused. Your goal, and I, and I can tell you from counseling for many years with couples, how this is so important because I've seen this so many times. Your goal in sex should be to please her and give her pleasure and not to think of yourself first. A selfish and inconsiderate attitude in the sexual relationship is sinful, it's harmful. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Husbands, if you've been self-focused, you need to confess the sin to God and your wife, and you need to repent. You need to put off your self-focused attitude and behaviors and start putting on loving your wife first. You must study her and learn how to love and please your wife sexually. And this requires loving, open communication with her. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she's a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Husbands, you should be more concerned about pleasing and fulfilling your wife than you are concerned about pleasing and fulfilling yourself. Pleasing and satisfying her should be your main goal. 1 Corinthians 7, 3, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. But husbands are not the only ones who can become self-focused. Wives can be self-focused as well. Typically, though not always, this can be turned around. But typically, the wife will have a different way of expressing self-focus. Often the way a wife will express self-focus is in not wanting to engage in sexual relations with her husband. A young mother may not have any energy left after a difficult day of, of housework and taking care of young children. She may just want some sleep. A woman who works out of the home might be stressed out from her job and just want to get some sleep or, or just relax and sit down and read a book. Just as a husband hurts his wife when he is self-focused, so a wife hurts her husband when she is self-focused. If she avoids sex because she's not in the mood or tired, over time the husband will feel rejected and unloved. And so wives, you have as much duty to fulfill your husband as he has to fulfill you. Just as he needs to be considerate of you, you need to be considerate of him. A wife who habitually fails to meet her husband's desires is being self-focused. She's failing in her God-given duties, and it also is sin. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise, also the wife to her husband. So husbands and wives must not be self-focused. Rather, they must be other-focused. They should both have the attitude of serving each other and giving each other pleasure and just really showing love to each other. Let me give you a second directive from the Bible. Sex is to be regular and continuous. There's no set number of times per week recommended in the Bible for a couple to engage in intimacy, but there is a principle it should be often enough that neither spouse is experiencing frustration or temptation. In Proverbs 5.19, it says, as a, as a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. The word satisfy in this verse comes from the Hebrew word rava. It means to be satiated or to have one's fill. The Bible could could actually say, let her breasts satiate you at all times. Husbands and wives should be so satisfied and satiated with each other's, uh, each other's love that no one else would even be a temptation. Sexual relations should be often enough that they each have their fill and there is no frustration. The husband should be satiated with his wife's love and the wife should be satiated with her husband's love. And so sex is to be engaged in often enough to satiate and satisfy, and whatever that is between 
couples, that's their individual thing, but they both should be satiated and satisfied. Let me give you a warning about this. Couples can get into a habit of not having sex or not having sex very often. They can get busy or lazy or just too tired. And when that happens, they're living together more like a brother and a sister than a husband and a wife. And this is a dangerous routine to get into. When couples rarely engage in sexual relations, frustrations can mount and temptations can become strong. The Bible warns against this very strongly. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 is a command. It says stop depriving one another. When couples are not regular and continuous in having intimate relations, they're setting themselves up for disaster. They're setting themselves up for Satan to tempt them. When a husband is deprived from having sexual relations with his wife, he may be tempted to look at pornography. Pornography has never been easier to obtain or more accessible than it is now. It's, with, with a few clicks of the mouse, a man can view X-rated pictures in the privacy of his own home, just, just like that. And the problem is becoming so prevalent that wives are getting involved in pornography as well as husbands. It's becoming a big problem for women as well. And so Christians, stop depriving your spouse from sex. Even worse than pornography, when a spouse is deprived sexual, sexually, the reality of sexual unfaithfulness, it becomes a real possibility. Most people who commit adultery never planned on it happening to them. Most people who have committed adultery, if you talk to them, if you could go back a few months before it ever happened, and if you could ask them, would you ever, do, would you ever commit adultery, most couples would say, never, it would never happen to me. Most people who commit adultery never planned on it. They're usually frustrated in their marriage, <clears throat> and they meet someone of the opposite sex who begins to give them attention, maybe someone at work, some type of a setting where they're at. And from there it often just becomes, it gradually, gradually builds this attention and it's out of control one day. A person can find themselves with another person other than their spouse in an adulterous situation. And so husbands, wives, the Bible says stop depriving one another of sexual relations if the Bible says to stop depriving each other, then to, to deprive each other is sinful. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 and 4 says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. Likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. So when the Bible says stop depriving one another, this means that a couple has to make sure that their spouse is satisfied and not frustrated. It would be a wise thing for a wife to ask her husband, are you satisfied? It'd be a wise thing for a husband to ask his wife, are you satisfied? And even if both the husband and the wife are mutually tired or not interested, this must not become a habit. Must not become a habit. To habitually disengage from sex is sinful. If there's a lack of interest in each other, there's almost certainly an underlying problem that needs to be addressed. As a Christian, you cannot disengage from sexual relations with your spouse, even by mutual consent, and fulfill God's calling on your marriage. Can't do it. Couples who have physical conditions, heart disease, fibromyalgia, other health problems that can stop a person from having intimacy. Uh, they can almost always still satisfy each other sexually. They, they almost always can find a way to. Often there's medications, there's treatments that can help. But unless you're truly physically unable to have sexual relations because of an actual disability, <clears throat> such as heart disease, 
The Bible says the two shall become one flesh. And even if they have heart disease, they can still hug each other and kiss each other and hold their hands. They, they need to be intimate in some way, some capacity. There needs to be physical touch. Even if a couple's 90 years old, they need to be holding hands. They need to be close. Couples who have simply become lazy who, or who have let their marriage deteriorate to the point where they've lost interest in each other, they're living in a way that's, that's displeasing to God and they need to do something about it. They need to do something about it. <clears throat> Sexual relations are to be regular and continuous. When couples engage in premarital sex, they're sinning. When married couples stop engaging in sex, they're almost always sinning. Not always. There is heart disease. There is things like this. But if they stop intimacy, that's wrong. And so the Bible says to stop depriving one another and to be satiated at all times. And so, Christian, we must not act like God's commands are optional. They're not. Sex is a command. You ever thought of it that way? It's a command. In marriage, it's a command. Stop depriving one another. Let's go to a third direction. Sexual relations are to be equally initiated and reciprocal. This is one I run into a lot in biblical counseling. Very important, very important to understand this principle right here. There's a popular notion that the husband must be the initiator of sex. This is certainly not biblical, and it's in fact harmful. If a wife seldom initiates sex, her husband will almost certainly feel rejected over time. Now, everything I say can be flipped the other way too, okay? It's just that the, the popular notion is that the husband must be the initiator. And the reason why is because the husband is the head of the home. He's the leader. And so because of that, people will think that Many people believe that the husband must be the initiator of sex. This is a very harmful thing. Both husband and wife have equal rights over one another in the area of sex, and they both should be submissive to one another when their partner desires sex. Furthermore, they should both be initiating sex regularly. Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 7, 3, again, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, Likewise, also the wife to her husband. The husband does not have authority over her own body, but the wife does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. By the way, you guys, when I start talking husband, wife, and he and she, sometimes it just comes out wrong. So if I say something wrong, just correct it in your mind. You know what I'm talking about. Now, this is an interesting passage, and I want to just digress here for just a moment because this is really important to understand. In every area in Scripture with a married couple, the Bible says that the husband has authority over his wife. We go to Ephesians 5, and we see that, don't we? And it says the wife must submit to her husband as to the Lord. The husband's the head of the home. The husband must not uh, abdicate his role. He is the leader. He is the head of the home. But it's very interesting. There's one area. There's one area in Scripture where the husband is the head of his wife, and the wife is the head of of her husband, and that's this area right here in the sexual arena. When it says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is the one area where there's, the wife has authority, the husband has authority. They both have authority. And what that means is that they both need to lead out. They both need to lead out. They both need to initiate. They both need to engage. When you initiate sex, you're showing your spouse that you desire them. Initiating sex and showing desire is a way to deeply confirm your love to your spouse. If one couple if one of the couple is always the initiator and the other one does not initiate, 
what will happen over time is the one who always initiates will actually start to feel rejected, even if they're having regular relations. Don't underestimate this. God has written this, that the husband must fulfill his wife, the wife must fulfill the husband. Husband doesn't have authority over his body. Wife doesn't have authority. That's all there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Both are to initiate. Both are to show love. Both are to be actively involved. Not just one. Not just one. Very important. Part of the joy and the pleasure of sex is just knowing your partner desires you. So initiate. Make sure your partner knows that you desire them. Engage yourself and let your spouse know that you, that you mean it. You want to be with them. You desire them. To merely submit to sexual relations without showing passion or interest is nearly equivalent to rejection. You, you get what I'm saying? If one person always initiates and one person submits to it, but they're not showing interest, they're not showing interest, it wouldn't be happening if the one wasn't initiating. If one person uh, just merely submits, but they don't show passion, they don't show interest, they just go along, over time, that becomes nearly equivalent to rejection. And so husbands, make sure your wife really knows you love and desire her. Wives, make sure your husband really knows that you love and desire him. Both, both of you participate. Both be passionate. Both engage. Both initiate. Be engaged. Song of Solomon says, 710 says, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. It's amazing. I'm just going to say a little bit more about this and then I'm going to move on to some questions. This last part that I just talked about, how both people must engage and both, both people must be reciprocal. I, I just can't even tell you from how many times I've seen this in the counseling room, how harmful it is on a marriage when it's one-sided. It, it's, it's amazingly harmful. And so I, I just want to put it out there. Um, if your marriage is like that and you haven't been the initiator, whether you're the husband or the wife, if you haven't been the initiator, I want to encourage you to start initiating right away. Show your love, show your passion, show your desire. Be that initiator. Don't neglect this important point. It really matters. All right. I could definitely hear a pin drop even on the carpet, I think. <laughs> you think it's uncomfortable there? You should be up here. <clears throat> All right, so let me, let me raise some questions, okay? I'm going to raise some questions. First question, what if I have no libido? What if I'm just not interested in sex? Well, go to your medical doctor and get an examination to make sure there's nothing physically wrong with you. If there's nothing wrong, often the lack of desire comes from problems that have accumulated in your relationship over time. These problems must be fixed. Christians do not have the option of having a mediocre marriage if they would be pleasing to God. I'm going to repeat that. Christians do not have the option of having a mediocre marriage if they would be pleasing to God. If there are problems in your marriage, if there's problems between you and your spouse, get biblical help if you cannot resolve it yourself. Get help. If you develop a serving attitude, your desire will often change. I'm, I'm still on the topic of what if I have no interest. If you develop a serving attitude, your desire will often change. If, if you do not have a strong interest in sex, you must remember that your goal is to please God by pleasing and loving your spouse. You can engage in good sexual relations with your spouse, even with a low libido, if your aim is to serve and satisfy him or her. In time, if your focus is other-centered, you'll begin to be blessed by giving pleasure to your spouse in spite of your own lack of sexual interest. And this alone will increase your desire to engage in sexual relations with him or her. In other words, 
what often happens is we, we, we have in our mind, we can break our mind up into different parts. And, and one part is our desires, one part is our will, uh, our affections, and so on. There's these different parts that we just kind of divide it up in. Our feelings, our emotions. If our feelings and emotions say, I'm not interested in sex, and we let that run us, then often people won't engage in relations. With, they won't have intimacy. They let their feelings run them. But if they say, you know, I'm not going to let my feelings run me. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And God says he wants us to be one flesh. Then a person can let their will run them. I, 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 this, is kind of, this might sound kind of weird, but the will is a little hard thing to understand. So I, I, like, to, I like to term it something else. This might just sound weird, but I... So when I'm counseling, sometimes I call the will our, our wanter, that thing in us that wants. I call it the wanter, okay? So that's strange, I know. <laughs> but let's say the feelings are like, the feelings are back in there, and they say, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I, I don't feel like being in, engaged in intimacy with my spouse. But the, the wanter part, that other part of your brain says, I want to, I don't desire it, my feelings are all against it, but I really want to do it because I want to please my spouse and I want to do what's right in God's eyes. So now you have this conflict in your brain. The feelings are saying no, but the wanter is saying yes, I need to do this. Well then you listen to the wanter. I really want to do this, even though I don't feel like doing this, and you start doing what's right. And guess what happens? The wanter leads out and the feelings are like a bunch of little kids that follow it. The feelings come along. It's really true. And so there's a lot of guys tend to, to really rev up fast. You hear like a microwave oven. Women are more like slow, uh, don't always feel like it right away. Uh, so, so that ends up getting into this problem where the guy's the one who's always initiating and the, and the woman's not, or vice versa, but you know what I'm saying. To the one who doesn't feel like it, to the one who is the slow starter, just stop for a minute and think the wanter part of you does want to do this because it's pleasing to God. The feelings don't. I'm going to just go by the wanter part. I know I want to do this. I don't feel like it, but I want to. You just listen to that, and you do what God wants you to do, and you pray for his help, and you just act out. You just do it, and the feelings catch up, and you're doing what's right. So don't let the feelings run this thing. If it does... If it does, the marriage is going to be, your, your whole intimate relationship is going to be based on the control of your feelings. Your feelings can change by drinking a cup of coffee. Do you really want your feelings to run this part of your marriage? Do what's right. Amen? Do what's right. Do what's right. Let me go to a second question. What if I don't feel like having sex because things aren't right between us? Well, here's a quote from Jay Adams. Love is not feeling first. Before all else, it is the determination to do good for another person because God has told you to do so. Love begins, therefore, with the desire to please God. Love toward another is a willingness to give to him whatever you have that he needs because you know that God wants you to. Where true love exists, the feelings follow soon enough. Don't let your feelings rule you. Work on getting things biblically resolved between you and your spouse, but don't let your feelings stand in the way of sexual relations or intimacy. I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard, that sex is a barometer. When sex is not good, it's an indicator that things aren't right in a relationship. We've all heard that. And you know, there's truth to this. This is, this is often true. When a husband's unkind to his wife, she might not feel too loving in the bedroom. When a wife nags her husband, he might not feel like giving her affection. If the sexual relationship is <clears throat> suffering, couples should look, should look closely <clears throat> at other areas in their marriage and, and see if they've been hurting each other or neglecting each other they've, or, or if they've been sinning against each other in other ways. Um, <clears throat> they need to... Just, just examine their relationship and confess any sin to God and to each other and forgive one another and get things right. But let me give you a warning about this. 
There's a very real danger in looking at sex as a barometer for your marriage. While it's often true that a lack of good sex is an indicator of problems in other areas, it's just as true that a lack of good sex can cause problems in other areas. It works both ways. Fixing your marriage problems can enhance good sex, but having good sex can help fix the other problems in your marriage. And so work on both. The average self-help book out there is going to tell you that sex is a barometer, and if things aren't right in the bedroom, go fix everything else. The average self-help book out there isn't going to tell you what the Lord says Stop depriving one another. Start loving one another. And so just realize, yeah, there may be problems in your marriage and other areas, but when you stop engaging in intimacy because of that, all you do is go down a spiral and further those problems. Very, very often, when couples haven't even figured out how to talk it out, how to work it out, I mean, they need to go get big biblical help if they, if, they, if they have to do that. They need to do it, and they should. But sometimes just by saying, you know what, let's just put everything aside. We got problems, but you know what? God says stop depriving one another. Let's just love each other. And when couples engage in intimacy, and they satisfy each other, and they're regular, and they're continuous, very often, a lot of the other problems start clearing up. It, 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 it works both ways is what I'm saying. And so don't get in that dangerous place of, well, our marriage isn't, sex is a barometer, we're not doing too good out here, so we're not gonna do good in the bedroom. Don't, don't fall into that trap. Just plain do good together in the intimate area. That alone will change your marriage. Let me raise another question. Are you guys getting so uncomfortable that you just can't wait till this is done? You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It is funny. It's just, it is really quiet in here tonight. <laughs> That's all right. I can have food and fellowship afterwards. Right? <laughs> can pornography enhance sex? Pornography is inherently sinful. And can, sin can never bring anything good. Some people use pornography to help them to get stimulated. And this is self-focus. The solution to getting stimulated is to concentrate all the more on pleasing and serving your spouse. Christian, that's where we ought to be. Think about pleasing and serving your spouse. Pornography is simple because it, one, it's self-focused. Another, is it brings another person into the bedroom. In Matthew 5, 28, it says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so pornography is adultery of the heart. It's not physical adultery but it's adultery of the heart and it's a sin against God and it erodes the oneness of married couples. It's, it's, it's never right. It's an interesting thing. There's something that's going on, just a little thing to, to be aware of. Um, in the last several years, we see more and more commercials on TV about uh, men who can't function properly. And so there's there's little blue pills and things like that out there. We see that. And, they, and, and, and you got to sit thinking, why is it that so many men aren't functioning properly that, they, that the, the pharmacies are, pharma, pharmaceutical companies are actually making you know, millions and billions of dollars off these little blue pills? Why is it? What's going on? What, what's changed? People probably don't realize it, but the number one cause of a man not functioning properly is pornography. You might not have knew that. It's not always that way. Sometimes there's a physical problem. Sometimes a person has diabetes or they have a thyroid problem or they have some kind of a problem. So there could be a physical problem. But the biggest problem out there is pornography. And here's why. There's what's called the law of lesser returns. The way our brain works, we see something, we do something, and there's a thrill. You know, that's why some people gamble. That's why some people, you know, 
whatever it is they do, that we, we, we see something or we do something and there's a thrill and it causes a dopamine release in our brain. But the next time you do it, you've done that already. And it, it takes a little bit more to get the same return. And over time, when someone's looking at pornography, when a man or a woman's looking at pornography, mostly men still, <clears throat> what'll happen is the things that initially aroused him and got him excited, and even though he knew it was wrong, it was simple, but he did it anyway, all of a sudden uh, what he's looking at is, well, he's gotten used to it. It doesn't do that to him anymore. So he looks at more and more things and, and different things to be able to get the same return. And what happens pretty soon, he's, who knows what he's looking at, but whatever he's looking at, when he goes into the bedroom with his wife because of the law of lesser return, just being with his wife and seeing his wife isn't capable of arousing him anymore. And so he physically doesn't work very well. And so it's really the truth. Pornography is one of the biggest causes of men not being able to function. And so, I mean, it's very harmful to even in that way. But that brings us right back to the focus. The focus, that's all self-focus and it actually does damage. The focus men and women ought to be on your spouse, not yourself. That's God's way. The focus needs to be on the other person. Let me ask another question. What is permissible in sex? What is permissible? Well, anything is permissible if it is mutually agreeable, pleasurable, not offensive to your partner, not harmful, and not sinful. If something violates your conscience, you shouldn't do it until you're sure it's not sinful. Romans 14, 23 says, Whatever is not from faith is sin. Is, if, if something is harmful to your partner or yourself, you should never do it. If something is sinful, you must completely avoid it. And so God gives a lot of latitude, and yet if it's not mutually agreeable, you shouldn't do it. If it's not pleasurable, you shouldn't do it. If it's not offensive, I mean, if, 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 it's, if it's not agreeable, if it's not pleasurable, you shouldn't do it. If it's of, offensive, you shouldn't do it. It shouldn't be harmful. It can't be sinful. And so just sort of just ask yourself, does it fit into those categories? Let me go to another question. What if I'm not sure how to give my partner pleasure? Well, then you must learn to openly and honestly communicate with each other. Sex can be a topic that's hard to talk about it, and yet, I mean, even, even with your own wife, even with your own husband, it can be, you can be very self-conscious about talking about it, and yet you should learn to be very open with each other. After all, you are a husband and a wife, and you're one flesh, and you should not be ashamed. Uh, if you don't know how to give your spouse pleasure, ask. Just ask. They'll be able to tell you. Genesis 2.25 says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Well, let me bring this to a conclusion Christian, it's vitally important that you fulfill the mandate of your calling in the area of sexual relations with your spouse. God has said, stop depriving one another. Those are words from God. He said, be satisfied at all times. If there's an area that Satan will use to destroy a marriage, it's through sex. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, it says, stop depriving one another, one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, if you study the New Testament and you study all the places where it says Satan can tempt you or Satan can do something to you, you're gonna be surprised. It's not gonna be as many places as you think, okay? I mean, Satan, he can do things, but perhaps not as much as we think we give them a little bit too much glory. And at the same time, this is something to be aware of because this is one of the few places where it does say, stop depriving one another so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is an area 
where the devil can get into your marriage. This is an area where he can cause problems. If there's problems in your sexual relationship, don't let it go on. Don't let it go on. Look at your marriage and face whatever problems that you have head on. Christians must not settle for a mediocre marriage. Christians must not settle for a mediocre marriage. There to be a picture of Jesus Christ in the church. And so make your marriage and make your intimacy pleasing in God's sight. Let me give you a little bit of homework. I'd encourage you to memorize 1 Corinthians 7, 4, and 5. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I would encourage you to read Read 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5 with each other and discuss with your spouse what it means to stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time. You should talk about that. I encourage you to read Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 together. Discuss what it means to be satisfied at all times. How a husband should always be satisfied, how a wife should always be satisfied, that neither of them should be frustrated I'd encourage you to review and discuss this lesson with your spouse and to pray daily for God's help to love and to serve one another faithfully and continuously in your areas of intimacy. Pray that you would not be self-focused, but other-focused. If you have been self-focused, I'd encourage you, the very next time that you're together, be other-focused. Just be other-focused. Just do it. If you haven't been initiating, initiate. If you haven't been passionate, be passionate. Be reciprocal. This is all biblical. If you've been self-focused in your sex life, confess this sin to your spouse and to God and ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Ask your spouse to tell you specifically at least three ways that you can serve him or her in your sexual relationship. Talk about it. And this will help you to become other-focused. Other and again, if you've not been an initiator of sex, begin initiating right away. If you've not been passionate or engaged, start right away. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you'd bless the marriages here. I pray you bless each and every person in their marriage. And Father, in this area of intimacy, I pray you bless the marriages Lord, help each of us to be giving and other-focused and not self-focused. Help us, Lord, to show our spouse our love for them, even through physical intimacy. Lord, help us to be, to have that one flesh relationship that you desire. Cause our marriages, Lord, to be a picture of Jesus Christ and his church. Oh, Lord, let a lot, uh, uh, just a, a loving, uh, let our relationship be so loving. Let it, let it, the love of Christ be between the husbands and the wives here. And Father, we just thank you for this time we could be together. We thank you, Lord, that you give us instructions as how do we ought to live our life. Bless each couple here tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.